Okay, so this is lecture um, 2.6, and this is Cayley theorem. So, uh, and in some sense, it is just a review or a phrasing of what you already know. So, uh, I will just formulate everything in fancy language. So, theorem. Every finite group G is isomorphic to a subgroup of Sn for some so that's this theorem you already know. It tells you that every group is a group of permutations in some way. Permutations of what? Permutations of rows or of columns of its own multiplication table. So this is something which, which you already proved. So let me just quickly explain the proof from this homomorphism perspective. So uh, proof. So, I want to start with completely kind of linguistical uh, remark. So, G is isomorphic to a subgroup of Sn. What that means? So, it means that there is a certain subgroup of uh, Sn. Let me call it H. And, and then G. And then I want to construct a map from G to H, which is this isomorphism. So, um, I can do that, but there is a slightly more convenient way to think about it. So, uh, basically the idea is G is isomorphic to a subgroup of Sn. It's just equivalent to there exists an injective homomorphism from G to Sn. So let me call it uh, phi and usually homomorphi uh, injective homomorphisms are sometimes denoted by this uh, hooked uh, arrow. Okay, so um, so why this is true? So, so this fact is completely formal, obvious, but let me still kind of explain Clearly, so already the the proof. So let's imagine that G is isomorphic to a subgroup of S n. How to explain that there exists an injective homomorphism from G to S n? So the reason is very simple. So if you have a subgroup H of S n, it means that there exists a homomorphism from H to S n, which is just takes every element in H and sends it to the same element in S n. Just completely trivial one, but it will be an injective homomorphism. It sends every element in H to itself viewed as an element in Sn, and so it's injective because kernel um, consists of just the identity element because it's the only element which, which goes to identity. And then you have this map isomorphism from G to Sn, and it's a composition of two homomorphisms, so it's a homomorphism. And so we have an injective homomorphism from G to Sn. And clearly, if some element goes to identity under this composition, we know that second one is injective, so it will go to identity under this composition, but this is an isomorphism, so it's identity. That's why we got an injective homomorphism. And on the contrary, if you have this injective homomorphism, just take this H being the image of phi, and, and then, of course, we'll have the G maps to this image, and this map is injective because it was, and surjective because it's the image, so definitely surjective. And that's why we get a map here embedding there. Embedding is the same as, as injective homomorphism, and this is isomorphism, this is injective. So that's all very formal, very trivial, but please think it through, because later on, when we especially talk next quarter about modules and rings, we'll see so much of this, what's called usually kind of abstract nonsense, this trivial uh, ways to say linguistically uh, different things, which have the same mathematical meaning, uh, that it, it really helps. 
Okay, so uh, now, and, and from the point of view of formally proving something, it really makes things easier because, you know, here you need to say what subgroup we are talking about and so on. Here you just need to write down one formula for a map. And the formula which you already have seen, so what you do, you take G and you imagine that the elements here are labeled by G1 and so on, Gn. And then uh, uh, you can take any x in G, and then you can look at elements, so this is the same set as, as we already discussed, as a set x, G1, comma, and so on, comma, x, G, N. And the reason is I don't even want to write it because you did it in homework. So these elements are distinct. If two of them coincide by cancellation principle, these elements were not distinct, but these are just all elements of G. So these are distinct. And if you have distinct elements and their number is n, and this is a subset of your n elements, which is because it's a subgroup, definitely they coincide. So between finite sets, injective map is the same as rejective map is the same as bijective map, because it's finite. Okay, so um, we know that these uh, sets uh, are the same. So now I just need to say what happens to every element of uh, my group. And so um, the idea is that I take my element, um, sorry, I take my element x, and I send it to a permutation, g1 goes to x, g1, and so on, gn goes to x, gn. Um, and I can uh, write it down formally if I want to. So I can say that, so I'm constructing a, a map phi, right? So I can say that phi of x is a permutation, and if I want to see what it does with element i, so it equals to j if and only if, if I take x and multiply on gi, I get gj. So this is my formal definition of phi. So this is what phi does. And then uh, um, I can check. So I need to check two things. So first thing is that phi uh, is a homomorphism. And of course, it means that phi of x, y equals phi of x, phi of y. And how to check that two maps are the same? You need to apply them to something. So uh, uh, let uh, i be some element from 1 to n. Then I can compute phi of x, y. So phi of x, y, if I apply to i, that equals to j, if and only if, x, y, g, i equals to j, g, j. That's perfect. So now I know what my uh, left-hand side does. Okay, then I need to, to see what, what the other side does. So I know that, so phi of y does something to i. Let me say that it sends it to k. I don't know which k, but just that, of course, will mean that uh, y times gi is equal to gk. Um, but then I can see, so since this is true, I know that x times gk is equal to uh, xy times gi is equal to uh, gj. Okay, let me now erase this part and I finish the proof here. Okay, so x times gk equals to xyj equals to gj. So then, of course, it means that um, phi of x applied to k is equal to j. So we now can check that if I take phi of x, phi of y, uh, it's a composition of maps, applied to i, 
I get 5x applied to k. I get j. And so, so 5x, 5y equals to 5xy. So here, of course, writing it formally is a little bit trickier than to see it kind of intuitively, because yes, so multiplying, multiplying by x permutes them, then you multiply them by y, you permute them, the composition is multiplication by um, uh, x, uh, y. So um, you should be slightly careful here with order, though. Let's see. Right, that's fine. Okay, so um, uh, next part is I want to show that phi is injective. Phi is injective. And this is even easier. So let's just imagine phi of x equals to identity. So this, of course, just means that uh, x for every uh, i x times gi equals to gi. But in particular, of course, we can just take identity. So x times identity equals to the identity. But then it means that x is identity. So if x is a kernel, then it's trivial. So it means that kernel is trivial. And that finishes the proof because we constructed a homomorphism from g to sn which is injective and, and homomorphism, and this means that it's an isomorphism with a subgroup of Sn. But if you think a little bit about it, you will understand that probably, you know, this interpretation we discussed uh, with multiplication table is maybe prettier than this formal check of, of properties that my map uh, defined in this way is a homomorphism. So uh, it's good to have this uh, intuitions in mind. Okay, so uh, next topic, a uh, fairly large one, is uh, sign. So we'll talk about sign, we'll talk about um, even and dot permutations, and uh, after that we move to cyclic groups.